let me introduce this uh, session by saying that I'm a big, I'm a big fan of victimization surveys. Um, I think that I go back to Mike Planty's presentation, and when you think about the fact that victimization surveys are perhaps the only time that the public has an ability to directly define the crime problem without being filtered by authorities of any sort. So in that sense, I think a, a, a self-report victimization survey is a, is a particularly important part of any kind of statistical uh, system on crime and justice. Uh, at the same time, I'm a big fan, but there are methodological challenges that are faced by uh, by, by uh, victimization surveys. They also have a problem of, like any statistical system, with the idea of legitimacy. That they have to be perceived as accurate, independent, uh, in order for them to be believed and have any kind of moral authority in defining the crime problem and the solutions to the crime problem. And so I, I think that, uh, uh, the, in some ways, the, the biggest challenge to um, victimization surveys, in my mind, is it comes from two areas where it has the most potential to enlighten. And that is, uh, one of them is the darkest of the dark figures of unreported crime, which is rape and sexual assault. Uh, I think these are some areas where uh, the public looks to surveys as opposed to administrative statistics because they realize that administrative statistics are, are fundamentally flawed, largely because the victims of these crimes refuse to report them. So it's important that we have a self-report measure of these kinds of crimes. The problem comes where you have such intense advocacy around these, around these, group, around these issues that um, they, they seriously challenge um, the victimization surveys because in many ways, certainly in the United States, advocacy groups want the highest numbers possible so as to make their case with the public for resources and other things. Uh, so much so that very often they've gone out and started their own surveys to get different because they thought the official statistics were too low in that sense. So um, the technical challenge of measuring this crime and measuring it well is a fundamental part of maintaining the legitimacy of these systems. Uh, and so the work that we're going to uh, talk about today or a series of studies that were undertaken in the United States to begin to look at the technical issues of how you go about asking people about their experiences in rape and sexual assault. Because there were radically different ways of doing it, and these radically different methodologies produce radically different results. And the, conf and the result was confusion on the issue, but also an attack on the survey method. So this is an attempt to sort of uh, investigate the various theories and the various approaches that people have taken to measuring rape and sexual assault uh, in the context of a self-report survey. There are certain design features of surveys that we know lead to higher estimates, certain design features that we know lead to lower estimates. And so this series of papers takes a look at a, a variety of those techniques, uh, some, in some cases in split samples uh, tests, uh, to begin to, to winnow out which of these techniques is the best to use uh, when you are trying to get an accurate estimate or of, this, of this crime and the change in, in level of this crime. So um, we have uh, four papers. Um, the first is uh, uh, Lynn Langton, the, uh, the impact, and, uh, and, and Chris Krebs will be speaking on this one as well. It's the impact of rape and sexual assault definitions on rates and characteristics of victimization. The second paper by uh, the, the Chris, I guess this would be, uh, data collection methods for improving the validity of self-report sexual assault data. Uh, and then Alan Beck uh, will talk about measuring the incidence and prevalence of sexual victimization. Uh, as, and this reflects his experience with the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which was a large-scale survey trying to measure the level of, of rape and sexual assault in prisons. Uh, and finally, uh, David Kanner uh, will be comparing three measures of rape and sexual assault uh, that were undertaken at the behest of BJS. So, um, Lynn? Thank you, Jim. Um, while we're waiting for this to um, come up, Dr. Krebs and I are presenting on overlapping surveys today. So we're going to be splitting the presentation. 
And I'm going to start just by giving you a little bit of background on these two surveys that we'll be discussing that measure rape and sexual assault victimization. The first is the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is one of our two measures of crime in the United States. It's a counterpart to the law enforcement statistics that are compiled by the FBI from local law enforcement agencies. And so the NCVS is designed to get at the dark figure of crime, as Jim mentioned, crime that's unreported to the police. And so while we measure a range of different types of violent and property victimizations, the survey is particularly important for getting at sensitive crimes that are less likely to be reported to the police, like rape and sexual assault and intimate partner violence. So BJS has a long history of measuring victimization, specifically rape and sexual assault victimization through the NCVS. And in 2014, the White House put together a task force to, um, to look at the issues of rape and sexual assault on college campuses among college students. And one of the focal, focal points of this task force was on conducting surveys on college campuses to understand the problem of rape and sexual assault on that campus, and then the characteristics of the school and the policies that may be associated with higher or lower rates of rape or sexual assault. So because of our experience um, with the NCVS, um, the task force asked BJS uh, to assist in developing and testing a methodology and a survey instrument that could be administered on college campuses to get at these issues. And we, BJS, contracted with RTI International to conduct what we call the Campus Climate Survey Validation Study. Throwing around a lot of acronyms here today, um, but we'll refer to that as the CCSVS. So just to give you a sense of some of the differences between the National Crime Victimization Survey and the Campus Climate Validation Study. Um, so the NCVS, again, has been in the field since 1993. It uses a longitudinal panel design. So uh, persons in the sample are interviewed every six months about their victimization experiences during the prior six months. And they're in sample for about three and a half years. Um, it's uh, conducted by interviewers that do in-person and telephone interviews. Now this is contrasted with the Campus Climate Survey Validation Study, which was a one-time pilot survey conducted with just nine colleges and universities. So these are not nationally representative estimates. Um, in contrast to the NCVS, which is use, uses interviewers, um, the CCSVS was an online self-report survey. Now, in addition to some of the methodological differences between these two collections, uh, the instruments are also quite different, and the way the two surveys go about measuring rape and sexual assault specifically is quite different. The NCVS uses a two-stage process. We have a screener and then a crime incident report that's used for classifying the type of crime experienced by victims. But with both the screener and the crime incident report, you can see here we use language like rape and unwanted sexual contact without actually defining for the respondents what those terms mean. In contrast with the CCSVS, we used behaviorally specific, explicit language to define exactly the types of contacts that we wanted respondents to report on. And this is a screenshot from the CCSVS this gives you a sense of the type of language that was used in the survey. So unwanted sexual contact was defined as sexual contact you did not consent to and that you did not want to happen. And then we provide examples of types of sexual contact and ways that unwanted sexual contact could occur. So everything from touching and grabbing to the offender using force to incapacitation where the victim is unable to consent. So the question is, given these methodological and instrumentation differences, is there an impact on the prevalence and incident rates? And the answer is, you can clearly see here, yes. Big differences. So the CCSVS, 
gets a prevalence rate about 10 times higher than what we see in the NCVS. And I should just back up and say that although the surveys are, uh, the NCVS goes to a general population, but for the purpose of this analysis, we've limited it to female students 18 to 24 to try to increase the comparability of the two surveys. So the prevalence rate of the NCVS is just for female students. And then you can see that the victimization rate, the differences between the two victimization rates, are actually even greater than with the prevalence rate. Um, I have to say that it is a bit tough for me to uh, put these findings up here um, because it suggests that the NCVS may be underestimating the, the rates of rape and sexual assault. Um, and I don't want to suggest that that completely negates the value of the NCVS. Um, the NCVS is a standardized methodology and instrument. It's been administered consistently over time and it's consistently administered across different subgroups in the population. And so the survey does have a lot of utility for um, understanding trends over time, for understanding patterns in the subgroups and populations. Um, but it appears that we have some work to do in terms of improving the magnitude of rape and sexual assault that we're collecting with the survey. So are there things that we can learn from these two surveys that will help us to uh, understand the differences? And we've developed three hypotheses here. The first hypothesis is that um, the NCVS, because of the language of the survey questions, it's capturing different types of incidents in the CC CCSVS. The second is that um, the NCVS uses a shorter reference period, and it controls for telescoping because of the, uh, the panel design of the survey. And so that, that results in lower rates of victimization. And then the third hypothesis is that uh, the NCVS interviews may not be conducted in private, that uh, you have better privacy with an online survey mode, and that increases the likelihood that victims will report their victimization. So hypothesis one has, has two parts, really. The first part is that um, the NCVS may be less likely to capture incidents that involve incapacitation because we do not specifically ask about it in the screening or in the crime incident report. And then the second part is that the NCVS may be missing uh, certain types of rape and sexual assault victimizations, um, particularly those known in the literature as unacknowledged rape. So this is the idea that uh, victims may not view themselves as victims of rape or sexual assault. And so if you're not asking them very specific questions, they may not report what they experienced as a rape or sexual assault. And there are certain types of uh, victimizations that may be more likely to fall in the category of unacknowledged rape. Um, perhaps incidents that, uh, that are more serious in nature more likely to be reported to the police, which helps with the victim recall as well, and more likely to be committed by a stranger rather than an intimate partner. So looking here at the first part of this hypothesis, what we're looking at here is the rates of victimization with the campus climate survey and the NCVS. But the middle column there shows the rates for the CCSVS if we exclude incidents involving incapacitation only. So you can see that this does have an impact on the rate, but it certainly is not accounting entirely for the difference between the NCVS and the CCSVS rates. Now looking at a comparison of the types of incidents experienced by victims in the CCSVS and the NCVS. Um, based on this idea of unacknowledged rape perhaps not being reported as much in the NCVS, we might expect that the NCVS would be capturing more incidents of rape versus other sexual assault, that the proportion of rape victimizations would be higher in the NCVS. But what you see here from this figure is that we're actually not picking up any differences. Um, about 30% of incidents in both the NCVS and CCSVS were classified as rape versus other sexual assault. And we can also look at the the relative seriousness of an incident um, based on whether or not the victim reported um, being upset by that experience. And this figure shows a comparison um, in victims that felt the incident was moderately to severely distressing. 
And you can see here that the NCVS does get a slightly higher proportion of victims that uh, found the incident to be moderately to severely distressing. But another thing to point out here is that if you look at the not at all to mildly, the NCVS is still picking up victimizations uh, for which the victim did not experience that same level of distress. Another measure of severity is how likely the victimization was to create disruptions. And this is interesting because unlike the other two figures, we do see some differences here with the NCVS, with higher a proportion of victimizations uh, causing problems with family or friends or problems with school or work. So there are some differences here in terms of the relative severity of the incident, or perhaps it has more to do with the, the victim's ability to recall the incident because they had those, those, they experienced those problems. This figure is showing that a higher proportion of NCVS victimizations, both rape and sexual assault, were reported to the police compared to the campus climate survey. So here you see that, again, the NCVS is uh, capturing incidents that perhaps better recall or perhaps more serious. Uh, but another thing to point out here is that even with rape, uh, less than 30% of female college students in the NCVS were reporting to the police. So these are still relatively low numbers. And then the final, the final part of that hypothesis is that we might expect to see a higher proportion of NCVS incidents committed by a stranger versus someone known to the victim. And here you see in this figure that does not hold true. In fact, the NCVS is picking up a slightly higher proportion of victimizations committed by an intimate partner. So moving on to the second hypothesis then, um, this is looking again at the six month reference period in the NCVS compared to the reference periods that we used in the CCSVS, which were uh, since the beginning of the academic year, since entering college, and then a lifetime. And then also the idea that the NCVS interviews may be bounded in time by the panel design to control for telescoping, which is the idea that a victim may report on incidents that occurred outside of the reference period as though they occurred within the reference period, thus resulting in higher rates of victimization. So this first slide compares the uh, prevalence rates in the CCSVS across the different reference periods compared to the NCVS. And then we've also limited the CCSVS reference period to the prior six months to have that comparison. And as you would expect, uh, lifetime rates of victimization are of course significantly higher than what we would see since the beginning of the academic year in the CCSVS. And then the, the proportion, the prevalence rate does drop slightly if we limit it to um, victimizations that occurred six months within the six months prior to the interview. Uh, still, this doesn't account for the difference, again, in the prevalence rates in the NCVS. And the other thing to point out here is that we see seasonal differences in when college students experience victimization. This figure shows the number of sexual assaults by the month in which the victim reported that they occurred. And what you can see here is that there's some clustering at the beginning of the school year. And then the other important thing to point out is that in the last columns, you see we had a relatively large number, about 1,000 incidents, for which the victim could not provide a date. And this could be um, just the product of recall. They were unable to recall the date when it happened. Or it could be suggestive of telescoping. So the victim did not see the date that their incident occurred as an option. It happened outside of the reference period, and so they just didn't provide a date. So for this analysis, we're just gonna assume that any incidents for which the uh, victim did not provide a date were telescoped in. And uh, you can see here from the comparison, when we do that and we exclude undated incidents, both the victimization rates and the prevalence rates decline slightly, but still, again, this does not account for the difference between the CCSVS and the NCVS. And then our final hypothesis is that the mode used in the CCSVS may allow for, uh, allows for greater privacy and encourages higher reporting of victimization. And we use the same mode across all of the CCSVS interviews, 
or across the survey administration. So here we're looking specifically at NCVS data. And when, in, when interviews are conducted in person, we have a measure of whether it was conducted in private or not. So whether someone else was present besides the interviewer and the respondent. And what this figure here shows is that um, the rate of victimization when interviews are conducted in private versus non-private is significantly higher in the NCVS. So there is some evidence that privacy has an impact. But again, you see the difference here, 8.2 victimizations per thousand compared to 3.7 per thousand for non-private interviews. So this, again, does not still account for the differences. 8.2 per thousand is, is still significantly lower than the rate we're seeing in the NCVS. So what do we take away from this? Uh, well, we take away that uh, more research is needed, certainly. Uh, we have a lot more work to do on our end. Um, and we see that you know, differences in the rates can't be entirely attributed to the instrument or the methodology. Um, it looks like mode and privacy matter. Um, the behaviorally specific language matters. And the telescoping may matter to some degree, but less. Um, perhaps than, than mode and, uh, and the language used in the instrument. And so with that, I will turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so Lynn has already spoken to you quite a bit about the CCSVS. Um, and what I'm going to do is touch on what we did to assess the validity that we collected for the CCSVS. As Jim said, uh, collecting data on rape and sexual assault is very challenging. But if you're going to do it, it's really important that the data have credibility and that people have confidence in the utility of the information so they can use it to inform policy and practice. So when we went into this study, which is really more of a methodological effort than anything else, we put in place a number of things that we would be able to do to assess the validity of the data we are going to collect from college students. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the things uh, we did to enable that. Um, the response rates for our study uh, were higher than we anticipated they would be. Anytime you're doing an online survey, it can be challenging to get college, uh, college students to respond. Um, but at the end of the day, things went quite well uh, for us. And on average, we had 54% of the undergraduate women who were asked to participate in the study uh, complete the survey. It was about 40% for undergraduate men. But interestingly, there was also a lot of variation across the schools. There were nine schools that ultimately participated in the CCSVS. And uh, one school in particular had a, a response rate of over 70% for women um, and 60% for men. Um, so we were happy with those response rates. And one of the things we wanted to do is compare respondents and non-respondents to see if there was any bias associated with, with uh, the non-response. Um, and this is a lot of numbers that I don't need to, to talk through all of them or anything, but one of the things we do is we look at uh, information on the respondents and the non-respondents, and we use data from the rosters uh, that we obtained from the universities, and they gave us information like age and year of study and race, ethnicity, and GPA, uh, things like that. And we were able to, to make comparisons at the school level to see if respondents and non-respondents were different on any of these observable dimensions. Um, these are Cohen's effect sizes. These are all um, rather low. I did put in bold any that are uh, 0.15 or higher. Um, but all in all, this is pretty good news. The places where you see dashed lines uh, just means that the uh, school did not provide that data element on the roster. So we felt good about the level or, or low level of non-response bias um, in our data. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the prevalence rates, because we are very interested in, in the statistical precision and stability of the prevalence rates. Um, this is a lot of colored dots, but I'll walk you through what they mean. On the far right is where you have the average across the, the nine schools. And you'll see that the red dot indicates that about 10.3% of undergraduate women experienced a completed sexual assault since the beginning of the academic year. Um, in our definition, sexual assault is kind of an umbrella term uh, and means that they experienced unwanted sexual contact. If that unwanted sexual contact involved penetrative sex, then they experienced a completed rape, which is represented here in the blue dot, which are about 4% of women experienced a completed rape. And if they experienced sexual touching or forced kissing, 
um, but not sexual penetration, then we deem that they, deter they experience sexual battery and does not include rape. And those are the green uh, triangles. So one of the things that's very interesting about the results is the variation across schools. You have a school on the far left, number two, where all of those rates, sexual assault, rape, and sexual battery are below 5%. And on the far right, you obviously have a school that has a much higher rate of sexual assault. Um, but the majority of that is, is, is a function of, of the rate of sexual battery. And you see a lot of variation. The lines on either side of the dots represent the 95% confidence intervals. So those tell us how statistically precise the estimates are. And when those confidence intervals don't overlap, we can say with, with certainty or with confidence that one estimate is higher or lower than another. And we wanted to, to look a little bit about this, at the stability of these estimates and, and try to make sure that we felt good about what they were telling us. And it looks like none of my graphics are going to work which is kind of interesting and unfortunate. Um, so I'm going to skip past that one. Oh, this one worked. That's exciting. This other one looked kind of similar. It's a lot of squiggly lines. One of the things we did is we looked at the victimization rate every single day of data collection. So across the bottom is a, is a dimension of time. It's how long the survey was fielded, 57 days across these nine schools. Um, and each of these colored dashed lines or, or squiggly lines um, represent the nine schools. And one of the things you worry about when you do a study like this is that you're going to be more likely to attract victims to participate in the survey than non-victims, or vice versa. So we looked at victimization rates by day. And interestingly, at some schools, the rate started out high. And then over time, as we collected more and more data, more and more completed surveys, it went down and then it leveled off. At some places, the rate started out rather low and it climbed, and then it went down and then it leveled off. The red vertical line to us um, is, is kind of our proxy for where we feel like there was real stability in the, the sexual assault prevalence rates. Um, and we think it's important that we stayed in the field as long as we did so we could start to realize some of that stability. Because over time, you're, you're getting less and less bias in your sample or a, a more and more representative sample as time goes on and you complete more and more surveys. And here's sort of an indicator of that. Again, this is a lot of numbers, but I'll just point out some that, that, that teach us what we did here. So the full field period was 57 days, and on average, the prevalence across the nine schools was 10.3%, with a relative standard error of 1.8%, and that's a, a measure of statistical precision for us. If we had stopped doing data collection at 21 days, we simulated this, uh, the prevalence rate would have been slightly higher. Um, but the relative standard error would have gone up by almost 50%. Um, and that's important because when you're trying to, to understand estimates and, and speak to how precise they are, and you're trying to compare subgroups within your sample, that relative standard error is really important to being able, able to make distinctions between uh, the prevalence rates for groups. And obviously across the schools, these numbered varies. But certainly I think if we had stopped at 21 days, we would have ended up with um, less precise estimates uh, and, and less accurate prevalence rates. Something else we used is a statistical technique called latent class analysis to look at the validity of our results. Um, essentially, what this is allows you to do is, is create an estimate of false negative and false positive bias. So a false negative is when someone tells you they were not, did not experience unwanted sexual contact when in fact they did. And a false positive, of course, is when someone tells you they did experience unwanted sexual contact when, in fact, they did not. Embedded in our survey, there were four different questions that to respondents really seemed like four different questions, but they had related elements. And those four questions were, the, I'm paraphrasing the questions here, but essentially they got asked, did you experience unwanted sexual contact? And some of these questions were next to each other, and some of them were in different parts of the survey. So did you experience unwanted sexual contact? How many times did you experience unwanted sexual contact? And obviously, they could indicate zero. Did you experience unwanted? And then they were asked a series of five separate questions of different types of behaviorally specific sexual contact, sexual touching, oral sex, intercourse, anal sex, and then penetration. And then four, when was the last time you experienced unwanted sexual contact? And of course, they could say never. So you can imagine that if someone was answering a survey from recall and truthfully, you could expect these survey questions to pattern in a certain way. And in fact, when we look at it, we see that 93.2% of the 15,000 women who completed our survey answered those four questions in a perfectly consistent manner. 
but 6.8% of them did not. And then through using uh, latent class analysis, you're able to assess the amount of classification error or the extent to which you falsely classified people as either victims or non-victims. And what we see is that uh, false negative bias is pretty slight, but it is greater than the false positive bias. And if we were to apply a correction factor for this, it would increase the prevalence rate in our data from 10.3 to 10.8%. Um, so not a big jump, but certainly uh, when people don't answer those four questions in a perfectly consistent manner, we can assume that that's somewhat of a function of false negative bias. And the other thing latent class allows us to do is, is identify the items that seem to be associated with the least amount of classification error. And in this case, the number of times question and then the behaviorally specific question uh, was most effective uh, at, at limiting or reducing classification error. The last uh, validation step I want to talk to you about is, is something we did to try to externally validate our data. Um, this was something that I went into pretty reluctantly, Lynn can recall, um, because you very often don't have anything to externally validate something like rape and sexual assault data, and that's because this is the most underreported crime in the world, and pretty much when you're trying to compare survey data on rape and sexual assault to official statistics, those things are worlds apart. Those are apples and oranges. Um, but we decided to do it anyway, and one of the things that you all may not know about is something called the Cleary Act, which requires universities to report to the federal government any crimes that happen on or immediately adjacent to their campus and are reported to authorities uh, at the university. So it's kind of like law enforcement data. It's an official statistic on the amount of, of, of rapes or sexual assaults, and we wanted to compare to that as best we could. Um, so we decided to take advantage of that opportunity, and we did it for completed incidents of rape because we thought that would be perhaps the cleanest comparison. So the first thing we did is we looked in our data. In the CCSVS, when we weighted our data to represent all females at these nine schools, we were able to identify 2,380 completed rapes that would have occurred in our sample. We then found that 770 of them occurred on campus, so obviously not the majority. And then we noticed that 170 of them were reported to school authorities. Now, to be reportable under Cleary, it has to happen on campus and it has to be reported to school authorities. So when we look for commonalities between the 770 and the 170, we end up with 60 completed rapes in our CCSVS data that we expected would have been reported to under the Cleary Act to the federal government uh, for the nine schools that participated in the CCSVS. And when we look for that number in the Cleary Act data, which are shared publicly, it's 40. And because our survey data are survey data, they have a confidence interval around them, and 60 and 40 are not st statistically distinguishable from one another. So we think there's a few stories to take away from this. One. If you like Cleary Act data and you feel good about them, then our survey data look pretty good. If you like our survey data and how we went about collecting them, then actually the Cleary Act reporting data look pretty good, which is maybe encouraging because people have doubted the veracity of those data. Um, but we think the real story is that if you're relying on official statistics like Cleary Act data or law enforcement data for that matter to estimate the magnitude of rape and sexual assault in a given population, um, we think you'd be dramatically underestimating the magnitude of that problem. So just a few quick takeaways. Um, we were very pleased with how the CCSVS went. We achieved respectable response rates, uh, minimal non-response bias, very little missing data, very few break-offs. The survey was, took about 15 minutes to complete for students and fewer than 2% of those who started it stopped it. Um, we are, are happy about the st statistical precision of our estimates. They seem to be internally valid according to latent class analysis and externally valid according to Cleary Act. And we think the variation that we see across schools is really interesting and is going to be something to import, important to study going forward to understand why some schools have such high rates and some schools don't. We think school-specific results are really critical because until you have data uh, about your students, I don't think s schools understand um, the, the nature of the problem and can effectively address it. We think standardization in this case was useful because it allowed us to undercover that variation and see that some schools do in fact have high rate, higher rates than others and that the nature of sexual assault that happens on one campus varies. Um, the methodology is extremely cost effective, so uh, 
we collected completed surveys from 23,000 undergraduate males and females and it cost less than $50 per survey and half of that was the cost of paying a $25 incentive to respondents. Um, we think incentives were important. We think they helped drive response rates, representativeness of the sample and quality of the data. We think the survey should be in the field for at least 30 days so we can see some stability in those estimates um, and minimize bias. It's critical that they be able to work on mobile devices. We had about a third of the college students complete the survey on a smartphone, which we had optimized it for, and we thought that was really important. And perhaps mo most importantly, as we start to do this at more and more schools, we think we'll really be able to start identifying the factors, the student, the university, the environmental and cultural factors at a campus that might be associated with driving rates of sexual assault. And only when we really start to understand those problems do we think we can effectively um, address it and hopefully reduce prevalence. Thanks, Chris. Congratulations. You got un under the wire, as a matter of fact. And now uh, we're going from schools to prisons. So. Yes. Yes, Alan indeed. Uh, I'm Alan Beck. I'm at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and uh, I uh, received a, a, a gift from Congress in October of 2003, which was the rape, Prison Rape Elimination Act. And let me say that although it's named the Prison Rape Elimination Act, it's not about uh, prisons. It's not about rape. It's about all forms of correctional supervision, which involves prisons and jails, juvenile facilities, police lockups, court lockups, any form of confinement. And it's not about rape, it's about all forms of sexual uh, abuse, unwanted sexual activity in whatever form uh, that uh, abuse uh, takes. So it's a very broad uh, application for the Prison Rape Elimination Act. The Congress, uh, in its wisdom, decided that uh, we were to collect these data annually and report back to Congress within six months after the uh, reference year, and report in specific the incidence and prevalence of sexual victimization within prisons and within jails, rather than try to understand the nature of sexual victimization in a broad national sense. It's to actually measure the incidence and prevalence at a facility level, to rank those facilities, to identify the facilities with the highest rates. And the consequence of being on the list of high rate facilities is that they would be called to Washington before a prison rape review panel. And the administrators of those facilities would be called upon to talk about why those rates are high and what they're going to do about it. So you might imagine that uh, no one wants to be on that list. You might imagine that there's a great deal of fear of what we might find should they be sampled to be in the study. And so we're required to do that and have been doing that uh, since the act was passed. We first did a collection in 2007, followed it in 2008 and 2009. We followed it then in 2011 and 12. Uh, we uh, also had the requirement to interview kids in juvenile facilities. We had also had the requirement to interview former inmates, that is, people who are no longer in prison and who may feel uh, less uh, uh, anxiety uh, 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 reporting to us their experiences than they might have been while in prison. A code of silence perhaps exists within prison that might uh, reduce th these estimates. So in all of that work, we've interviewed about a quarter million um, uh, uh, inmates, uh, whether they be uh, adults or juveniles, prison inmates or jail inmates. So what I'd like to share with you today is uh, the logic, how we approached it, and offer up some um, basic conclusions about what to think about when, if you should have the opportunity to, to do this measurement as well, and to uh, also explore some considerations of validity and reliability, much like what Chris explored earlier. And so let me go straight to the conclusions and then kind of circle on back and get there again. Uh, let me say that, uh, you know, uh, a, a former president, uh, essentially when asked the question about sexual activity, ar argued that it depends on what sex is. And my goodness, when you're measuring sexual abuse, it really does depend on how you define it. The more broadly you define it, the higher the rate, 
the more explicit you are about the activity, the more likely you are to, to, to uh, collect a, a uniform uh, measure of prevalence. I would argue that behaviorally specific approach that we've heard about earlier is very strong in estimating prevalence, but relatively weak for measuring incident rates. And that is because there's significant overlap in the sexual activity that occurs in a specific incident. It's very difficult for victims to separate those incidents and to count them uniquely. And when asking high rate, high prevalence victims to do so, you risk inducing trauma. You, uh, you um, certainly have human subject issues when doing so. So behavioral specific approach, I believe, is very strong for estimating prevalence. The more you ask, the more you find, and if you don't ask, they're not going to tell you. But there are diminishing returns, and at a certain point, uh, you, you uh, uh, come close to saying, please, please tell me something happened to you after asking them the tenth time in a tenth different way something could have happened. And so you have to be relatively careful. Now, understand that the Prison Rape Elimination Act uh, mandates a targeted survey. It's about sex. It's about sexual activity. It's not about crime in the broader sense. It's a targeted survey, topically driven, and so you can get at very specific dimensions that characterize the experience. That involves the type of experience, the sexually explicit activity, the directionality. Directionality is imp important when it comes to victimization in prison. That means that it was either the, the respondent is saying they, it happened to them or they were forced or pressure, pressured to do it to someone else, to, to uh, be victimized in the course of being forced to provide that sexual service when they did not wish to. And the nature of coercion. Coercion is complicated and uh, extremely um, diverse. It goes all the way from willing activity that can't be willing simply because inmates are in a vulnerable position. They may initiate it, but with staff, but and the staff may uh, may be involved, uh, but it's still uh, unwant. It's still illegal. It's equivalent to statutory rape, and of course, it can go from the willing to the most unwilling, involving pressure, force, injury, a weapon, perhaps. And so rather than packing it into a single question or two in an omnibus collection, you can unpack these questions, spend a great deal more time trying to measure it, and I can tell you the more you ask, the more you'll find. We adopted the audio, audio computer assisted self-interview uh, mode of collection, which means it's computer assisted self-interview. The uh, questions come up on a laptop, a touch screen, uh, soft screen laptop in which very much like a kiosk in a bank where individuals are pushing uh, are pushing uh, response categories and moving the instrument forward. The audio portion is a synchronized audio uh, feed so as to address issues of literacy and low levels of literacy among this population. So ACASI is a synchronized computer assisted self-interview uh, mode of collection. It has been identified as a very good mode for collecting information that needs to be confidential uh, uh, and needs uh, to, uh, particularly in the setting that we're in, we have to mask staff from knowledge of what is the inmate has experienced. So if our staff came into no with knowledge that uh, perhaps a youth was victimized, there would be a law requiring mandated reporting for abuse and neglect. We can't expect inmates and, and victims who have not reported it elsewhere to report it to us if they, if, if they know that by reporting it to us, we will tell. And so a CASI protects our staff from knowledge of actually what the respondent is providing in that confidential setting. It has also been shown to collect uh, uh, sensitive data in more optimal ways, since after all a survey is a social interaction between people and uh, there are some things that people don't want to tell other people. And one of those is perhaps men reporting to a female interviewer that they have had some uh, experience of sexual abuse. You can imagine that not all men would be comfortable with that, and it applies to other, uh, other victims as well, women or, or, or uh, persons of, of 
other vulnerable statuses. ACASI has some limitations. Clearly, some respondents will struggle with the computer. Some will lie. Some will not fully disclose. But these limitations, as I'll show later, don't appreciably affect the estimates. We have found that a mixed mode of collection is necessary in our PREA work. There are some inmates who are too violent to bring out into a setting, in a confidential, in a room in which they can sit down to a computer and fill out the survey. There are those that he can't even be brought out in shackles and chains. They are restricted and it's restrictive housing. So uh, because these are the individuals that are probably the most likely to be, have been victimized and perhaps most likely to have been perpetrators in such events, uh, we need to go to them. So we actually did a paper and pencil uh, interview and I'll show you later that it truly matters that these, this group is a, is a high rate group that you really need to go after even though in some settings you can't do the, 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 the ACASI. And so uh, finally, as a matter of conclusion, uh, there's a strong need for an incident report. One step uh, screening with classification coming out of that screening is ill-advised. A purely behaviorally specific approach, I think, is ill-advised. If you really want to know about the detail of victimization, you need to ask the inmate, the respondent, to actually construct an incident and report on that incident. It helps particularly ensuring accuracy and trying to prevent telescoping, but it also provides substantially more detail when it comes to understanding the victim-perpetrator relationship. So let me show you a little bit of the results, and then uh, this uh, reflects just the uh, interviews that we conducted in prisons, state and federal prisons. Those are those that are under state and federal jurisdiction, house inmates typically with sentences of greater than a year, they house felons, they are the deep end of the correctional system, as opposed to jails, uh, in which uh, uh, there would be pretrial detention and short sentenced inmates. We did jail inmates as well. And so we randomly selected prisons, probabilities proportionate to size. In 2011, we were in 233 prisons, conducted 38,000 interviews, had a response rate of about 60%, uh, not so bad um, in, in the course of things. Um, and we found an overall rate of 4%. From a statistician's point of view, that's a relatively rare event. And uh, when it comes to rape, non-consensual sexual acts, the things that involve penetration, it's even a more rare event. It's a 1% phenomenon. Now, of course, that's uh, much higher than what you would get in the NCVS. And uh, we're talking uh, magnitudes of order higher uh, approximately 10 times higher. And um, abusive sexual contacts uh, when, among other inmates, 1%. Uh, that means unwanted grabbing, groping, touching doesn't involve penetration, it's sexual abuse, about 1%. One of the things that's been quite surprising for us in our work is uh, the uh, impact of sexual staff sexual misconduct, about 2.5% uh, rate. Um, now that's going down. I think that's the consequence of all the PREA-related activities and the attention being given to it, and particularly dropping related to willing activity. Willing activity means that the inmate showed no uh, uh, indication of, um, of any force, pressure, coercion, and, uh, and yet uh, we're engaged with the staff. Sometimes it's the inmate that initiates that activity. Sometimes it's the staff. And for other victims, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a mixture. The, uh, of course, we look for covariates of sexual victimization. And we learn a great deal uh, uh, about those covariates and the circumstances surrounding uh, victimization, the facility level covariates. Uh, in particular, we've learned that uh, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual inmates have much higher rates than other inmates much higher rates. Those who are, have serious mental illness have much higher rates than those who do not. We find that women are much more likely to report inmate on inmate sexual abuse more likely than men, while men are much more likely to report staff sexual misconduct than are women, and that staff sexual misconduct is disproportionately involved with female staff.
female staff are overrepresented by a factor of two among the perpetrators. So how do we go about doing this, and what did we think about as we did it? And so uh, we, I've already discussed the uh, ACASI, and uh, we uh, had to do um, facility level estimation. So that means a sampling design that particularly was large, and it took large numbers of inmates, uh, uh, potential respondents within each facility, because we had to offer some uh, these estimates with some degree of precision. We bounded the estimates based on coming to the facility in the last 12 months or since admission, whichever was shorter. The average exposure period for prisoners was about eight and a half months. That is, on average, inmates that we interviewed had only been in that facility for about eight and a half months. The focus was on prevalence rates, not on incident rates, and so forth. We uh, randomly assigned individuals to a non-sex assault survey. It was a key p c parameter uh, so as to protect the uh, uh, confidentiality and anonymity of the respondents. We were concerned that the guards who were uh, escorting inmates might uh, quiz uh, the respondents by assigning, doing a random assignment uh, to a different facility. We were able to mask their participation in the sex survey. We were also able to mask the uh, uh, content of what was being reported in the survey because one could infer based on the length of time it took to complete the survey that an inmate might have reported sexual victimization or not. Of course, the longer the time the inmate took to complete the survey, perhaps, the more likely they were to have reported sexual victimization. So we padded out the survey, employing other modules to fix the length of time uh, close to 25 minutes per uh, inmate, regardless of whether there was sexual victimization or not. We asked about direct experience, not, not perception of others. We separated inmate on inmate sexual activity from staff sexual, mis uh, sexual uh, activities. We um, uh, separated the activity itself from the nature of coercion, and it was a, a two-step procedure where we asked about uh, the activity and then whether they were forced to engage in that activity physically or without physical force, pressured or, or otherwise felt they had to. And we separated out the nature of coercion after that, and I'll show you that. So we used six primary screening items for sexual activity. You can see that they're very explicit. Um, I was somewhat resistant at the beginning, but understand you need to ask very explicit questions about hand jobs, blow jobs, oral sex, and all, all, all the other varieties of sexual activity. So we asked six primary screeners, and we followed up with uh, two secondary screening of, uh, items related to inmate and inmate sexual victimization, whether there was physical force used or whether there was for physical force pressure to make them feel that they had to do it. And it was repeated for each kind of sexual activity. We then asked about the explicit nature of that sexual activity, and you'll see you know, that range of, of the different forms of coercion, persuaded, talked it into it, bribed, blackmailed, drunk, high, all the way up through threatened with a weapon physically harmed. And so what do we learn? If you take a look at, at prevalence rates of any sex, you see very high rates of sexual activity within prisons. In fact, women are reporting much higher rates than men. 18% of the women said they and been involved in some unwanted sexual activity involving touching. Uh, we see uh, women reporting higher levels of oral sex than men. We see uh, anal sex having no gender difference. We see high rates of other kinds of sexual activity being victimized. Largely, that's about voyeurism uh, and um, unwanted exhibitionism. And then we see how it splits out between the physical force and the pressure. I think these things line up in fairly interesting, in interesting ways. So I, I suggest taking a look at this. Now we did do the latent class measures as, uh, as, as Chris described. In fact, Chris was deeply involved in this activity, as, was, uh, as were others at RTI. The latent class measures, I think, are a little overrated. And, uh, but I guess the good news is, is uh, it, it again confirms the notion that it can pick up false negatives. And in fact, we did. It moved the ult ultimate rate of touching from 1.5% without the uh, weight and class measures to 1.7%. We picked up 52 more victims out of the 32,000 that we interviewed. 
um, and you can see the impact on the other estimates, largely trivial. But it's good to know. And uh, so uh, here's the PAPI. The, uh, we see that the persons who were uh, administered a paper and pencil instrument, much smaller, much more condensed, but people in restrictive housing and were somewhat inaccessible, had substantially higher rates than those with ACASI only. We, we uh, interviewed about two and a half percent of the, uh, our respondents were uh, of, such, of such. So finally, uh, reliability, validity, uh, obviously, what concerns prison, prison in, uh, authorities most is, you know, inmates lie. And after all, that's why they're there, is they haven't been exactly truthful. And so we have tried to implement various measures of internal consistency, comparisons with multiple measures, prevalence rates by day, use of uh, debriefing items. Don't have the time to go through those. Uh, but uh, I can say uh, that the re based on internal reliability and some external validity measures, we have a great deal of confidence that what we're getting uh, actually reflects uh, the nature of activity while uh, in, in prison. We have a large-scale administrative record collection that co is a companion to this that uh, collects administrative data based on what comes to the attention of administrators on an annual basis. Uh, not only do we get allocations, but we get uh, the content, the substance, the description of substantiated incidents. We conduct surveys of former inmates. Let me say that the rates are just simply higher among those who are no longer in prison, but that's because of exposure. That is, they have gone through the full term, and we ask about the nature of sexual victimization from the time they were arrested to the time they were released from, uh, from parole, uh, from, uh, from prison to parole. And then we find uh, that uh, every now and then, when we rate a high-rate facility, lo, lo and behold, turns up in the press. And uh, so there's an external uh, factor there where troubled facilities are identified uh, by us as well as by the press through other means. So with that, I will pass it to uh, David. So I'm going to be talking about um, something slightly different. We did not uh, do an extensive empirical study yet. I'll describe a study that um, that uh, we finished up and we're in the process of analyzing and provide a few uh, bits and pieces from our pilot and a feasibility test. Um, so we're, what we're doing is we're doing a pilot study for the Bureau of Justice Statistics related to uh, redesigning and making recommendations on how to um, change the way the rape and sexual assault is collected on the NCBS. And as Lynn mentioned, there's a lot of uh, controversy in the United States because there are these different estimates that come out of various surveys that use entirely different methodologies. So it's certainly, when you look at uh, a CDC study that is conducted in the U.S. on, on violence against women, uh, called it, the acronym is NISVIS. Their estimates of rape are 10 to 20 times higher than on the on the NCVS. Uh, similarly, there was a study uh, uh, 20 years ago or so that used similar methodology as the NISVIS, and they that study also um, uh, had a uh, an estimate that was much higher than the uh, NCVS. So, uh, what our study is doing is looking into uh, why those, why there are differences, and to make ultimate recommendations for uh, what the NCVS should be doing in the future. We're basing our recommendations and our designs on uh, work that we did in parallel with the National Academy of Sciences, and they did a review of the NCVS with respect to how uh, rape and sexual assault is completed, and they pointed out a number of things that uh, should uh, we should take a second look at, one of which is uh, on the NCVS, um, as Lynn mentioned, every member in the household is interviewed, and sometimes those uh, interviews are not done in private. They might be done in front of another family member, which is not a, uh, a good way to collect data on 
uh, such sensitive topics, especially if, uh, say, for example, the offender or the perpetrator is living in the household. Uh, the NCVS is done in the context of a crime survey, which might uh, make it, uh, uh, might it affect how um, respondents interpret the questions. Asking about crimes versus asking about violence or harm is, are, are two different things to respondents. And then the big thing is the wording of the screening items. As uh, Lynn mentioned, um, uh, the NCVS uh, uses some terms like rape and sexual assault, and these other studies have used behavior-specific questions. So what the National Academy recommended and what we've been implementing is a, is a version that we might implement using these behavior-specific questions and then also trying to control for some of these other um, uh, issues related to privacy. Our sample design uh, is in five metro areas uh, in the U.S., and uh, we're, it's, it's basically um, two modes, one of which is ACASI. As uh, Alan mentioned, that's when the uh, respondent is uh, providing all their answers on a computer, so it's totally private. They have a set of headphones. And then we're comparing that to a telephone interview. Telephone actually has been the primary method that's been used by these alternative surveys. The one done by the CDC, for example, is done by telephone. And, and they still get very high rates. So we wanted to compare uh, an ACASI methodology to a telephone survey. Uh, we also, so we have a general household population. Uh, what we have, uh, what we call our volunteer sample, we recruited young females uh, in those metro areas uh, to volunteer for a survey, and we're also interviewing them. And then we also interviewed a small number of women who've gone through rape crisis centers. The two surveys are, are not entirely the same. They both use a 12-month reference period. Uh, they both use behavior-specific questions. The ACASI uses a 12-month uh, question, which is asking about the prior 12 months, as, a, as an initial question, and then it follows up with a lifetime item. Whereas on the telephone, which is the way uh, prior studies have done, lifetime is asked first, and then the 12-month question. Uh, the, the AKSC has, uh, uses a calendar to try to assist in the recall. Um, uh, the, the telephone interview does not, but then everything else is pretty much the same. So the big addition here is that we're using behavior-specific questions, but we're also using what um, Lynn referred to as a two-stage methodology. So we ask a series of behavior-specific questions, and then for each incident that the uh, respondent identifies, we then follow up with a, with a detailed incident form, which we ask specific questions about what happened, what was the behavior, what was the tactic. And then we also ask things that are related to the incident, like who did it, where did it happen, did you report it, uh, things that are typically asked on the NCVS. And the idea here is to look at what is the result of um, the, the overall uh, incident rates and prevalence rates when you use this two-stage approach versus the one-stage approach, which uh, many of the surveys uh, that have uh, used behavior-specific questions have used in the past. So we'll, one area that we'll be uh, comparing is both the coverage and the non-response bias related to these surveys. So one of the issues with one of the differences between the NCVS and these other surveys is that the NCVS has a fairly high response rate. So the response rate for the NCVS is, you know, uh, it, it's varied over the years, but I think now it's sort of in the high 70s, low 80s. Whereas the prior surveys that have done, used these behavior specific questions have been done by telephone, and the response rate is quite a bit lower. So the last time NISVIS was done, which is 2010, was, it was around 30%. Uh, things are going down since then, so uh, um, it could go down even more. So the question that uh, we wanted to see is whether this difference in response rate, something that Chris talked about in his analysis, are the people that were getting to respond different than the, than the people they were not getting to respond, and if there is some sort of non-response bias. So for example, in these uh, other surveys that have used the behavior-specific questions, it could be that it disproportionately is interviewing people who have been victims. And if that's the case, there could be uh, some sort of non-response bias, and we'll be looking at that. Other things that we'll be doing is we'll be comparing incident rates between the two methodologies, the content validity uh, of, the, of the incidents themselves. So we're asking uh, respondents to report in, in the form of a narrative about what happened uh, 
for each of the incidents that we ask about. And that is also relatively new. So using the behavior-specific questions in the past, what uh, the methodology is that if someone says yes to a particular question, and I'll show you one in a second, then they're classified as a victim of that particular type of sexual violence. Whereas on the NCVS, there's this follow-up with a second, with an incident form, which asks more specific questions about the incident, and the classification of the incident is actually done on the basis of that report, on the incident report. And uh, one of the primary goals of the incident form is to try to um, uh, look at possible either misclassification from the screener, which we know happens on the regular NCBS, as well as possible false negatives. And so we'll be collecting narratives, we, we have collected narratives, which describe the incident to actually get a good sense of what people are reporting when they're, when they're answering uh, the, the initial screener items. We're doing re-interviews to look at the reliability of the data. Uh, we're looking at the recall in, in similar ways that um, Lynn described uh, by looking at people who are dating things out of the reference period as well as the, the curve that, um, that Lynn showed you where you look at the distribution of the events across the reference period uh, and these other things. A big issue uh, that is also uh, something we, we're paying particular attention to are human subject issues. Um, uh, one of the, one of the um, criticisms of the NCVS, or at least this two-stage approach, is that asking something on an incident form might put uh, uh, victims through they're, re, uh, they're reliving the incident, and you're asking all these detailed questions, and this might cause uh, undue emotional distress among the victims. And so we're, we're collecting quite a bit of data on emotional distress, including debriefing data, looking at interviewer reports, um, and we're, we're, we're uh, monitoring that as well as uh, providing reports. Uh, we'll provide uh, summaries of, those, of, of the debriefing data in, in, the, in our report. Progress to date, uh, well, we're done. We've been out of the field for a while. We're in the midst of analysis, and um, we should have a, a final report in the fall of 2016. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, some of the preliminary work we did uh, when we were developing the survey. The first is a set of uh, interviews that we did uh, uh, to try to evaluate the behavior-specific questions and look at the two-stage approach. So as I mentioned before, uh, um, uh, we're using these BSQs, behavior-specific questions, and the BSQs are specifically designed around uh, the legal elements required to classify something as a rape or a sexual assault. So they ask about whether it was done by force, they ask about whether it, there was some sort of consent or not, and the capacity to consent. That has to do with perhaps the, the involvement of alcohol. And as Alan and, and Chris showed, you know, these, are, you, these use very specific and um, uh, sometimes fairly uh, graphic uh, terminology, and what uh, the way the BSQs are typically used is that if someone says yes to one of those questions, they're classified as a victim. So here's an example of, of a question like this. Uh, you can see that it has a number of different elements related to it, including the type of force and a behavior and a reference period. So uh, looking at these kinds of questions in a little bit more detail, uh, we wanted to see if there were some issues with interpretation of the items. Uh, when we did cognitive interviews with a large number of um, young females, we found that there were a number of ambiguous concepts. People didn't really quite understand, some people didn't quite understand what we might have meant by things like threat, force, uh, and in many cases, respondents didn't hold that entire question in their head. They might have heard the last part of the question, and they didn't pay attention, say, to the reference period at the beginning. And that was also found in a study done by Cook et al. So there have been very few qualitative assessments of, of uh, these BSQs. And so we wanted to look into this a little bit further as we were designing the survey. The results were consistent with what we had hypothesized, that uh, things like force, is not particularly straightforward for some, some respondents. So it can potentially get lost in the sentence. Uh, there could be a misinterpretation about which events we're talking about at a particular point in time. And the idea is for the two-stage approach is for follow-up questions to try to uh, 
provide a, um, uh, a follow-up so that you, you can get more details about what happened. So in comparing what happens on the screener versus what happens in those follow-up questions, uh, we wanted to see how well that worked. And that's, that's leading into the, the basic design of our, of our pilot test, uh, which we did a small feasibility study for uh, in uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. And this was in lead up to our larger pilot test, which we just completed. In that study, um, we wanted to see how the behavior specific questions compare to this two stage approach. Uh, as I mentioned before, some view uh, asking these follow up questions as unnecessarily uh, um, burdensome on victims and that they'll be reluctant to fill out the details. And others have compared what happens when you use the BSQs as classification versus what happens when you use the second stage second stage uh, uh, reports to try to classify. And Fisher found, in fact, that there was quite a bit of uh, change between what someone was classified on the screener versus what was classified on the incident form. We wanted to look into that a little bit more t detail uh, using, the, um, using the second stage as well as these qualitative narratives to sort of use that as a sort of a final arbitrator. So getting to the topic of my paper, comparing three measures of of uh, rape and sexual assault, it really refers to what we're, what we're doing on this project and what is illustrated in, in the analysis in this feasibility study. So we did about 200 completed interviews uh, equally uh, across each of the modes. These, this was a, a sample of volunteers. It was not uh, a random sample of, of, any, uh, um, uh, of any integrity, let me put it that way. So the first question that uh, we wanted to see was whether uh, respondents would provide details when asking follow-up questions, and indeed there was very little hesitancy to report those details. 44 out of the 49 people who had an incident to report actually reported it, and the remaining five uh, didn't report it for, for reasons that are not actually related to refusal. It had more to do with how we were asking the question, uh, which we corrected for the, for the main survey. And there was, there was some missing data for those reporting multiple incidents. So if they had three, three to fill out, they might not have filled out the third one. There was less willingness to provide a summary, this narrative summary, at the end of the incident form. Uh, we did allow respondents to opt out, and so some actually did take that opportunity. When you can actually compare the three measures of rape and sexual assault, what we did was we compared the classification uh, related to the behavior specific question versus what they filled out in the crime incident report versus what they classified based on the narrative. And the primary question here was whether the screening item is consistent with the other two measures. And we found that uh, for completed rape, there were obviously very small sample sizes here, that there was some discrepancy. It wasn't absolutely horrible, but uh, that uh, 13 out of the 16 or, I'm sorry, 11 out of the 16 um, uh, reports of rape, according to the narrative, were classified, uh, I'm sorry, 16 out of the uh, um, uh, incidents that were reported out of the screener as rape, of those 16, only 11 really uh, um, were, ended up being classified as a completed rape. And this is just an example of what uh, one of those instances were. So. Uh, this describes someone who was getting a ride that, uh, from someone at, that she had met at a party. He propositioned her. Uh, she ran out of the car, and he tried to grab her. So this was classified as, from the screening item, as a what we would classify as a rape because of forced oral sex. But it really is an incident that involved threatened forced sex. Another example has to do with uh, other kinds of sexual misconduct. Uh, we, we ask on the screener questions related to what we call coercion. Coercion has to do with non-physical threats. Uh, I'll give you bad grades. I'll promote, I, I won't promote you, that kind of thing. And in, in uh, here, there was, there was quite a bit more variance. Uh, and this was, seemed to be a particularly difficult thing to classify from, from the screener. And here's just one example here where someone, again, it's more of an, 
it's not an example of coercion as much as an attempt. So this person was basically fondling uh, some, the respondent and um, uh, she said she, you know, she wanted to leave and it, it just stopped. Based on the behavior specific question, this was uh, defined as coercion where really it was just unwanted attempted sex. So um, our general conclusions from the small feasibility study is that it is possible to combine the BSQs with follow-up questions. Um, respondents will answer the follow-up questions and it's important to try to minimize that burden. We can also collect narratives, although that, that is a little bit more spotty. At least from this, uh, classification based on the BSQs is uh, somewhat mixed. Completed rape, uh, there seemed to be some confusion about uh, how to classify an attempt versus a, a, a threat. And the misconduct questions also had very similar uh, issues. So we're carrying this kind of analysis forward in the pilot. Um, I didn't talk very much about measurement error on the detailed incident form. Those are survey questions just like everything else. And there, there's definitely measurement error there. So ultimately we believe we'll come out of this thinking that the best way to classify events is to use all, all information that comes out of both the screener, the, the, the crime incident report, and the narratives. Thanks, Dave. Um, I think that for those of you still awake, uh, we're looking for questions. I uh, haven't received any yet, but I have a few of my own uh, in that sense. Uh, and that is, um, uh, in the United States, uh, in sort of the debates over this issue, whether it be on campus sexual assault or prison rape or any of the venues that people are talking about, the, the, the design features that these surveys had are, are part of the debate. And I think one, for, one, for example, one of the biggest things is the definition of rape and sexual assault, that this definition varies widely across the, the population and across the interest groups. And so uh, another thing is the cueing strategies that people talk about here, explicit clue, cues, extensive cues, and so on. And this idea of two-stage screening uh, is another of the, of the design features. So let me ask you, I know all of you partake of this to some extent, but of those three things, and they're not the only three things, uh, broad or narrow definition, uh, a cueing strategy which makes explicit as well as extensive, the cues, uh, and this idea of two-stage screening. In your mind, of those three design features, uh, which would be the most important to get exhaustive and accurate reporting? Uh, you, can, you can tell me that I've picked the wrong three or anything else, but I'd like to see your Chris, you look like you want to jump in. Of course, we should, uh, do, it in, we should do it in order, but that's okay. I, okay, Lynn's else? first. It's on? Oh, okay, it is on, despite the fact that it's red. Um, so which of those three is the most important? Um, I, and I actually didn't talk about how we define rape and sexual assault in the NCVS in terms of the official definition that we put out in our reports, because I actually think that part may be less important because we don't use those different definitions in the survey questions. Um, so I think that's an important distinction there. Um, if you're defining it for the respondent in your survey questions, then the definition is gonna make a difference. But when we just keep it uh, more general and ask about unwanted sexual contact without being explicit, that, the definition that we use includes things like coercion. It would include things like incapacitated uh, sexual contact. But whether the respondent is thinking about those um, makes a big difference. Um, so in terms of which is the most important, I think uh, you know the, the question wording is incredibly important, and I think the privacy issue is important as well, particularly when you're dealing with uh, so a sensitive topic that a victim may not want to uh, talk about in front of an interviewer, perhaps, and uh, was particularly with another person in the in the room. Um, I was just going to say that I I think it's really important that we not use terms like rape and sexual assault when surveying people about those things, and and that's because those are legal concepts. And if you speak to, uh, in our case, a young woman and ask her what rape means and what sexual assault means. She, many of them will describe 
situations of a stranger jumping out, you know, you fighting, trying to fight them off and not being able to. They're describing, you know, kind of the extreme end of a, of a sexual assault or a rape, whereas we know that a lot of these things that happen to college students, they know the perpetrator, they have maybe even liked the perpetrator at some point, um, you know, things happen, things progress, they get assaulted, they get raped, but they would never define them in those terms. And it's, in fact, one of the reasons people criticize our research is because in a, a previous study, if you follow up with people you've classified as rape victims and ask them, do you think you were raped, many of them will say no. And it's because their legal or their conceptualization of what those terms mean and the actual legal definition of those things are worlds apart. So we think it's really important to not use terms like that. Um, and as Lynn said, that might explain a lot of the differences in prevalence rates across some studies. Yes, I, I, I might throw a bomb here, but let me do it. And I'm shocked. <laughs> and the bomb is, is I'm not sure that an omnibus collection can measure it well. And you can tinker around the edges, add a few more screeners, but unless you truly invest in a targeted survey, you're going to miss a lot of things in the survey. But, uh, and so, you know, behavioral explicit, yes. I mean, you really need to be as explicit as you have time for. And uh, it may well be that in, for certain things in the International Crime Victimization Survey or even in the NCVS, that you have to randomly assign an, a respondent to a more in-depth targeted collection to truly get at the extent and the nature of sexual victimization. And I don't think there's room, there's time in an omnibus collection uh, to do it well. You can add a couple more questions, but you still, I think, at the end of the day, are gonna lowball those estimates uh, in, in, in real ways. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the questions are obviously important. And the distinction between definitions and the questions, I think, is a bit, uh, it's blurry there. I think the cues serve to define what you're asking about. And so using these kinds of cues definitely broadens the scope. I think, I mean, I agree, that's the biggest issue. But, but now I think the issue is to try to, uh, you know, we've been so worried about false negatives, I think we also have to worry about false positives. Because now that we've w widened the net so much, and if something like the NCVS is, is really interested in trying to look at legal definitions, it needs to try to uh, make sure what they're collecting is consistent with what they're intending. The only reason I bring that up uh, to some extent is because if you look at NISVIS, which was another survey conducted uh, by RTI and, uh, uh, on this topic, that uh, about 65 or 70 percent were sort of alcohol-induced uh, situations. Uh, and I think it was a very high percentage. And uh, the alcohol-induced or the incapacitation in the, in the, in the, in the uh, survey of uh, students, in this case, made very little difference. It accounted for very little. So I was, uh, that's a scope issue, where you're including those things in the definition. I think Lynn's absolutely right, that it's not so much the abstract definition, but the queuing. But that's why I thought that was a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting finding. But we do, so two people woke up in the back, and they, and they have questions. So I, I'd like to ask you, the, uh, one is, what recommendations uh, are, do you have for avoiding non-response in these kinds of surveys? Pay them. Avoiding non-response. I'm sorry? Pay them. Pay them. Yes. Yeah. The, the, I'm sure uh, the, Inehi will be thrilled to hear that they'll, they'll give incentives. I don't know if they do that or not. But, uh. Well, I was just going to say I think incentives are important. But I also think in our campus work, we've seen um, that, that marketing effectively the importance of the survey um, and encouraging everyone to complete it and why um, is also pretty important. Do you think that's unique to the schools because of the I, controlled environment? Um, I, mean, I think it could be unique to the schools. I think it could also be unique or, or, or vary in terms of how much students trust the leadership and who that messaging is coming from. Um, I think that could be important as well. Possibly explain the variance across schools. Alan, you look. Yeah, I, I think uh, first and foremost, it's, ab it's about uh, who does the survey and the reputation that uh, of, uh, behind the collectors or the sponsors that uh, you ensure that it's a, it's a group that's uh, well-regarded and considered uh, 
bipartisan or non-political and not having an agenda. I think that's, that's key. Uh, I think um, robust uh, uh, consent where individuals ex uh, understand exactly what they're about to participate in and understand the, the nature of confidentiality and how it uh, is going to be protected. I think when it comes to rape and sexual assault, if you want to avoid uh, item non-response, you have to have a self-administered part of the survey. I think you have to think about creative ways to peel off the personal interview uh, apart from the self-administered part and to think about certain items that are best collected through a self-administered application, whether that's a paper and pencil or some other kind of, of um, self-administered administration, web-based or, or whatnot. But I think item non-response is key uh, in, in, in all of this. I, I was just going to also say, it, it also needs to be a brief, a low burden. It, you have to make it easy for them to do it. And surveys that go on for an hour and have complex tables and uh, very quickly respondents lose, lose, lose attention and break off. I want to squeeze one more question in because of the long sufferers. And that is, uh, is there any evidence? It's, we've already answered this question to some extent, but, it, but it's sort of asked from the opposite side. Uh, is there any evidence that the use of the terms crime and rape actually does reduce interview, interview reports in these incidents? You've sort of answered the opposite, but uh, does that answer this question? Well, I don't think there's actually ever been an experiment, but there has. Oh, okay. NISFIS did one. NISFIS compared the crime context to the health context to the relationship context to see um, if it would result in different response rates or victimization rates. But did that change the screeners? It, it changed the intro right. of the survey. But so it was not, introduced in yeah. a different way. Right, but it's not asking on the questions, were you raped versus, you know, did someone force you to have intercourse? It's a difference between cues and context. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sorry, there, there was no significant differences across those three oh. treatments. Has it been published? No. That, on, <laughs> on, that, on that nice note, uh, <laughs> we want to thank you all for your participation and, uh, and for coming. To, uh, we, hope you, uh, we hope you learned something. So thank you. Agradecemos la participación de nuestros ponentes, así como el moderador en su intervención en la mesa.